From Classical WETA in Washington, we take you behind the music as we get into it all with conversations with local and touring musicians. Go on deep dives to figure out things like, what exactly is a symphony? And in this episode, I'm with pianist Wu Han, one of the most influential chamber musicians and recording artists. We talk about her start in Taiwan, how she got involved in arts administration, and even how to fix your concert clothes with a stapler. Welcome, Wu Han. Thanks for coming on the podcast. I know you are incredibly busy. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> so you can take a second and just sit back and relax while I tell people all of the things that you're up to. First, you're a very active pianist. You're performing all the time. You are co-founder of Music at Menlo, a chamber music festival in California. You are co-artistic director of the Chamber Music Society at Lincoln Center. You are artistic director, artistic advisor for chamber music at the Barnes & Wolf Trap. You are co-artistic director of Chamber Music Today, a chamber music festival in Korea. And you have your own record label to run, Artist Sled. Is that, I'm sure I'm missing something. I'm exhausted from listening to you. (laughs) I'm exhausted from reading it. I don't... How are you able to kind of keep all these things together? Do you have like a a set routine you do every morning in regards to, I don't know, business and practice or or what? Well, when I wake up, first thing I think of is music. I am a foremost performer, so I have to make sure I don't embarrass myself, walk on stage to play concert. So the first thing is go straight to the piano with my coffee and at least do three to four hours before the shops open. And when the shops open, it's a disaster, usually. Tons of emails and lots and lots of uh, inquiries and uh, phone meetings. And usually I will go to New York to do all of the New York business. Uh, Sometimes I have to connect to the Far East because Chamber Music Society not only has series in New York, also has partnership in the Far East, that's in Taiwan, in China, in Wigmore Hall, in London. So the time difference, I have to catch up for that. By about 5, 6 o'clock, I will shift to the West Coast. The Chamber Music Festival in the Silicon Valley, Music at Menlo, will need attention. That will last me for about 7-ish, and then I will probably go to a concert. Concert starts at 7.30. Either I oversee one or play one. Um, depends on the schedule. I think that was like 32 hours you just named, but there's only 24 hours in the day. So, but that's really important to start the day off creatively. Some of the most Absolutely. creative hours are in the morning, right when you wake up. Yes, your minds are fresh and you are inspired, and usually you get so much done. You're the most imaginative. By six o'clock, you need a drink. Exactly. And, <laughs> and go to a concert. It's not a bad thing, uh, but it's it is a it is a life that requires tremendous amount of discipline. Yeah. So speaking of inspiration, I think most musicians have like a moment where they 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 have a moment where they realize I have to do music for the rest of my life. I have to for a lack of a better term be a professional <laughs> musician. Yes. Is there a moment like that for you? If I tell you the honest truth, you will be laughing. Okay. I was about 11 and I started late. I was 9 years old. So the first two, three years was so hard, lots and lots of practice, eight hours a day, drills and scales and arpeggio. And finally, I was about 11 and a half or maybe 12. I was sent on my first concert tour. And I was really scared and really excited. And I remember we were put on the, one of the most beautiful hotels. And, you know, I am come from a very modest background. I never see, like, Western towels and, you know, fresh top white towels and beautiful beds. And that was just amazing. And I remember I had to run to the rehearsal and took a shower, put the, uh, the towel on the floor. When I came back to the hotel, the towel magically crawled up to the bar and it was fresh and my bed was made. And I remember thinking, this is a life. I want to be a performing musician. It's, a so, it's such a silly story, but somehow that idea of you can be rid of the daily mandem sort of responsibility, and you're supposed to make a living from dreaming and from inspire others and making beautiful music. It was that sort of moment, a click in me that, wow, being a musician is, is something unusual. 
But then the real commitment came from actually after September 11. I played a lot of concerts in my life. I was on stage since I was 12 years old. It was that month after September 11, I remember getting phone calls from everybody. Um, I have concerts in Cleveland, in Connecticut. I'll call them and say, do you really want us to come? They say, absolutely, we need music. And I remember packing up, David and I packing up our little girl. We didn't want to leave her in New York alone, driving overnight to Cleveland, taking, there's no flights, driving everywhere in the country to play concert. And I remember every slow movement, there will be sobbing sound coming on stage. And it make you realize, first, the power of music, second, we all need music in our life at some point. It's a language that everybody can understand, and especially in the most important moment of our life, that music has that power to heal, to fill your soul, to repair, to enrich our life. And that was another sort of a incredible month, an incredible moment. I actually understood that the reason I'm a musician and not just because I can make a living to pay my bill. I had to do something special. And that was the month that I committed to the artist administrative kind of life, designing programs, building organization, make music happen. And I tell you, it gives me so much pleasure and I feel a huge sense of responsibility all the time. That's incredible. I mean, well, the story starting off when you're when you're 12 years old and you're going on on a on a kind of concert tour. That's that's abnormal for for everyone. And then there's uh, I've never heard a story like that where just a little thing like the towel being different and being a musician is a whole nother world uh, yeah. that people don't realize. But so many powerful moments in life mm-hmm. are accompanied with music. So you got you said you got into kind of this administrative um, programming role after September 11th. Yep, I was uh, artistic director in La Jolla Summerfest for three years, and that was lots of fun. And that was my first artistic director job, and it's a fancy place, beautiful. You get lots of attention, you have lots of press, and it's all glamorous and beautiful. But after September 11, I thought, hmm, that is a different story. I need to devote more time for that. I quit my La Jolla job because I want to keep playing more concerts, and I had my daughter who was four or five years old. But it was that moment I said, Wuhan, you, are, you should not take this thing so casually. You can make a difference. So that's how I started Music at Menlo in the Silicon Valley. That project I want to prove that Silicon Valley will love chamber music. The myth is everybody's sitting in front of the computer and it's all the the, the technology is the one distract everybody. And at that point, the San Jose Symphony went bankrupt. Everybody's saying, you're crazy to go to Silicon Valley. Everybody's too busy. I said, no, no, no. I, let, let's, let's just try it. There are lots of young family there. There's 11 youth symphony orchestra there. They should have family that value classical music. And I was totally right. <laughs> you were exactly right. Um, so maybe that's why a lot of these things, uh, Music in Menlo, um, the Wolf Trap and Lincoln Center, all these things have had kind of significant impact because you fell into it or got into it with a very sincere um, interest or a belief or a passion. It yes. wasn't just, oh, yeah, I'm in arts administration and um, who's playing next year or whatever. But it was really trying to make an impact in people's lives and, and the music, like you're just saying, bringing this chamber music uh, <laughs> festival where everyone thinks it doesn't belong. Yes, that's exactly right. I love the art form of chamber music. It's so fascinating to see the human interactions. For those of you who might not know chamber music, the idea is as small as two people, as large as maybe 19 or 20 people, you can do a Brandenburg concerto without a conductor. That's very important because the idea is everybody is equal. 
I'm an artistic director. When I walk into a chamber music re- rehearsal, with the 18 years old or even 14 years old, we're completely equal. Doesn't matter your age, your status. You become fast friends. You discuss idea. You use psychologies,、uh, diplomatic suggestions.、Uh, you try to figure out how to advance the whole group in the very short period of time. It's a great training ground. For communication, for making constructive suggestions, for trying to move forward without offending or uh, uh, hurting somebody's feeling. So, and then in the end, even you can communicate all your idea. You have to walk on stage in the equal footing, and you have to learn how to trust and respect each other. Otherwise, nobody it will fall all over the place on stage, and then for the audience to watch the interactions, to watch the last minute, it's like an acrobatic、um, circus act. If somebody dropped the ball, then nobody really dies <laughs> <Yeah> . in this <laughs> case. But it sounds bad. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a fantastic art form, and I fell madly in love with it coming from. From the Far East, with no chamber music training whatsoever, and I discovered chamber music. I was so in love with it. I decided to devote my time, my life with it. The programming、um, element is something I'm always fascinated by because I always want to make sure that my audience, if they give me two hours, their precious time these days, I want to make sure is two hours worth some worth their time, worth their trust. In me, so I tend to always give me myself some guidance and share my thoughts with my audience.、Uh, this past season in Wolf Trap, we have done a whole exploration, all center around Vienna, Austria, not Vienna, Virginia.、Yeah. Um, and I want to just, you know, provoke people's curiosity. How? Why is Vienna so important? What is the influence? So we have many, many different programs to. Go from Vienna to Hollywood through Corngo, who is a Viennese, travel to Hollywood and write film music.、Um, how Vienna connected to Prague was through Mozart, and、uh, what is the Prague's influence for that? And so, you know, it's very interesting to design a program with different journeys. And I have heard that audience loved it because it's not only they come to hear great performance, they have program that makes sense to them. It provokes their imagination, and also the artist I brought in is spectacular. Of course, <laughs> I think、um, sometimes we don't give audiences enough credit for. Well, they want to learn more. They don't just want to hear,、um, you know, music from Vienna. They want to know. Well, why and why this or why that and what happens after that? I am with you. The biggest mistake anybody will make as a programmer is dumbing down our audience. I think these days people are so curious.、Uh, you have internet; you can go anywhere to learn anything. I am like that. If somebody tell me something is a little intriguing, I am on in the internet trying to fulfill my life. Uh, to learn more,、um, classical music is not a simple art form. It's not for entertainment, in my opinion. It's like, yes, you don't need to know a lot. You always enjoy it. It's like drinking wine. But if you know a little more about wine, the region, the different taste,、uh, um, you have more comparison. You you really learn. Uh, the difference between Sauvignon Blanc and you know、uh, Chardonnay and white and red. Y- yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you eventually become a connoisseur, and you can enjoy more. And for me, there's three senses in your life: is what you put in your mouth, what you see, and what you hear. Yeah. Right. So we enjoy food always. That's very primitive. We see beautiful things. We love that. We all want to go to museum and learn more about arts, understand where arts come from, and then I think music is the most important thing. You can be as sophisticated as you want to get, and so teaching audience how to enjoy that, teaching them, give them some kind of raw map. It's really so so important.、Um, I really believe in that, and I know I have built a lot of audience through this belief. So. Come to a lot of chamber music concert, please.
Classical Breakdown is made possible by Classical WETA. Join us for the music anytime, day or night. To listen live, just go to our website, classicalweta.org, or download our app. It's free in the App Store. Obviously, even as you said, you're very, you're very curious person. Um, <laughs> has borderline nosy. Oh, okay. <laughs> but do you think as the as time has gone on since the beginning of the internet and like just changes in technology and everything, have you noticed a way or a change in how audiences react to or enjoy music? Has it changed even the live experience? Um, actually, yes or no. I found the audience have more access point. Uh, you can turn on your computer. You can hear any radio station. You can sign up for a streaming uh, uh, service. You can go to any kind of recording. That's incredible. I found the audience get more selective who they want to trust. That's just nature of the business. But I found people treasure the live experience. You can only sit in front of your computer for so many hours. Uh, the, the act of getting out of your normal life, the act of dressed up, um, maybe have a drink or maybe have a meal before or after, the act of having a social uh, situation in the concert setting with like-minded people, that all want to avoid the mandan life. Um, I think that's really beautiful. I'm a strong believer in for musicians to dress up as fancy as possible, as festive as possible. Really? Yes, I think that takes you to a different world. Um, I became a pianist because my father took me. You had to get this thing straight. I was eight years old. My father got home some... Um, he went to the American F- GI's flea market. My mom wants him to buy a suit to go to a cousin's wedding. He came home with a turntable and a stack of LPs. Nice. Started to play this thing and say, this is the greatest thing I ever heard. It's so fantastic. He started to search out for concerts. This is 1960s in Taiwan. We were in the middle of the rice field. There's one little old town hall kind of thing. Periodically, they will have concerts. My dad will bribe us because we didn't even have money to take the bus. So we have to walk 45 minutes in the hot Taiwan sun with bugs around. He will say, if you come to concert with me, you'll get ice cream in the end of the road. So, oh, absolutely, now I have to go. And I remember hearing... I believe it was Lily Cross, but I don't know for sure. It was this most beautiful European lady wearing the most beautiful blue gown and played the most beautiful music. I have no idea what I heard. I just remember that sensation. There's somebody on stage is better than me, is making this amazing sound and take me to a world that is not, seems impossible when I was eight in Taiwan, and being complete, taken to another mo- most beautiful, sophisticated world, I, I want to belong to that. I want to be like that. It gives you hope. There's beauty. There's something way above me. And it's, it's incredible. It gives you that sort of vision that you can be better than who you are at the moment. Yeah. And I I never forget that sensation. And I remember, God, I want to be like that. And I remember also going to Carnegie Hall to hear Fisher Disco. And and wa- he walked on stage. Or oh, Horowitz in the Met. That's another concert I never forget. They walk on stage and they're an artist. They're something like way beyond who the normal people people that can achieve. They can make magic on that stage. I was completely taken by that. And I I still go to concert looking for that experience. And I think that's what you can get from the live performances. You are watching a, 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 a unreal world. It's so beautiful and it's so touching. And you walk away, have the melody in your head, and it 
lasts you for a long time, and you never forget that. And that's what you don't get from the computer, from any technology you can invent. Um, so I, I always, in all the concert production that I run, I always try to recreate that magic, taking away all of the unnecessary distraction, the bad lighting, the, the noise from the AC, and I love or make sure all my audience are quiet and you know I'm very picky when I'm doing a song recital I want to make sure the page turn is not in the middle of the song uh, mm. you know so you take away all of the distraction and I know it will transport us to a magical place and that's what you cannot get yeah. you got to go to live performance to experience that you know, I think I'm going to complain less now when I have to put on a tuxedo <laughs> That's, <clears throat> that's not what I meant. But <laughs> the audience. Well, okay. So let's let's talk about dress up for concert. Yeah. All right. You don't need to do that. I only do that for myself. I'm a bit old fashioned. I like to know that I'm having a special evening, and I I I love what these artists do on on stage so much. I know how much work that they have put in from being a musician myself. So. I always like to dress up myself to go to a concert just for the sake of, for me as a performer, for the sake of um, transformation. You yeah. know, I will make announcement as an artistic director wearing my daily clothes. I'll go backstage and put on my performance clothes, and I know I'm in a different zone. You're stepping into a whole new role. Exactly. And so that's important for me. For the audience, I actually don't care as much, but I want to make sure they know they are walking to a place. It's a special place. It's a place that people put in thousands, thousands of hours yes. to try to achieve that. And that, for me, I just love that. It's the <laughs> only experience you get by being there live. Exactly. <laughs> Now, speaking of Taiwan, and um, I know you with your work in Korea and also playing in Japan or China, chamber music or just classical music in general has exploded in <laughs> Asia. When you're talking about before walking 45 minutes to go see this concert, now, if I'm not wrong, the largest performing arts center in the world is in Taiwan. It's the it's national. In Kaohsiung. How do you say it? Kaohsiung. Kaohsiung. It's in the south. I'm playing there this uh, December. The yeah. pictures. Look unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> Have you been there already? No, not yet. Okay. But I just, I met with the director. He wanted to present multi years and they don't have much chamber music. So I'm going to try to help him. Uh, we're going there for a concert this December and we'll be videotaped. Hopefully, we'll be broadcast uh, later. But you see this whole new explosion of growth in classical music over there. Yes. Um, I remember playing in China. Uh, a year or two ago, and we were in a city with like millions of people and a huge performing arts center that didn't. E the city didn't exist like two years before that. Must be Shenzhen. And now, the, yeah, now there's now there's millions of people <laughs> yep. there, and it's. And I'm, so I'm wondering, is there? Well, one, there's not not just to say like a, a new market, but does it feel like chamber music is? I don't want to say like a bigger part of the future of of classical music in general, but it does offer something special. It is more intimate in a way, and it also is more flexible. Yeah. I would say two things in the Far East. Oh, I came from Taiwan, and I go to China a lot as well because I'm Chinese and I can speak the language and communicate with the audience there. In general, it came from a tradition of especially come, come from the parents. If you know more about art, especially Western art, you will be a much more, uh, you will have better chance in your life to advance in a very, in a society that is very much, um, um, how do you call it? It's very rigid. Mm -hmm. um, being an artist, you can break rank. You can be a farmer's daughter. If you're a great pianist, you go all the way up. Right. So as a artist or as a musician, that gives same thing like when I was a kid gives you so much hope that you can be a different in a different class. So that's really important. And education, the belief in education, 
uh, as a, especially as a balanced education from all the parents. That is the reason it pushes all of the classical music explosion. In the Yamaha company, the logo and the advertisement is if no kids will be bad kids if they know how to play the piano. Yeah. <laughs> You'll be a, only smart kids play the piano. And it's all kinds of sort of pushing to the parents. So that's, I think that's really, really important. Chamber music is not there yet. I'll be honest with you. Uh, everybody back at the Far East wanted to be Long Long, to be the great soloist right. and to reach that pinnacle of the success. That's really important. However, chamber music, you are right, is the most flexible. It's the cheapest way to make music happen. Solo is a very expensive, you know. Yes. Orchestra takes at least 60 people. Dance company, lighting designer, costumes, no way, right? I don't know how music, dance companies do it even. Exactly. It's really expensive. Opera needs tons and tons of support, financial support. Chamber music, it does not require a large audience. As small as two, music will happen. Yeah. Yeah, and there's another interesting phenomenon from my observation is chamber music is actually in, exploding in the United States. There's so many new concert series happen right now. I was just in Chattanooga, Tennessee, Two days ago, uh, the music director, Gloria Chan, this girl went to Tennessee, found the Hunter's Museum, loved the setting, raised the money, started a concert series. It's their 10th anniversary last Tuesday. The place was packed. Absolutely gorgeous setting. People went completely crazy. It's so simple. It's only three of us. Um, just Music just happened. Uh, Another important factor is most of the people are involved in chamber music are usually very nice people because the art form demands it. If you're not nice, nobody wants to play with you. Right. <laughs> as simple as that. So most of the people are involved in chamber music are quite fun-loving. You need that sort of personality to want to work with others. You have lots of empathy. Uh, you need to be uh, supportive as a friend, as a musician, you also need to lead everybody. So this particular art form develop, emphasize the best of the human quality. It sounds like that's a great education tool for, for kids. You know, if you're in a big orchestra, you're lost in the crowd. Um, and it sounds like that is also a very effective thing for you, getting into administration. I mean, if you can't communicate, uh, <laughs> you know, good luck. But as you've said, it's so democratic. You have to work together. You have to come to an agreement together. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like that is those are some very great qualities you need in someone who's running or creating an arts organization. You got it. And you have to be really sensitive to others. You have to learn how to listen very carefully. And you had to be always at all time strategic, try to figure out how to make sure everything go forward smoothly. It's so easy. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's the greatest education uh, tool. And in Menlo, in Music at Menlo, we have a workshop. I usually spend about four weeks every year through this Chamber Music Institute. We have kids as young as 10, as old as 29, two different programs. Younger program is nine, no, 10 to 19, and then 19 to 30. I tell you, it's the most fun things to watch. The 10 years old come in, they can't rehearse with each other. Right. <laughs> you sound bad. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you play like that? Wow, I don't like the way you sound. No. Listen, okay, Kathy, calm down. Let's see what you can say to make sure your friends will play better. You know, yeah. that was just, that's that was how we teach the kids. And then by the second or third years, you were said, you know, maybe we should start with Dumbo. That's really so much more fun. <laughs> you know, yeah. the the suggestion and the, the the attitude just you can develop that. And I wish parents understand that. It's yeah. it's. It's the best sports, in my opinion. Um, it's the sports on your brain, not physically. Yeah. And it's also teamwork. And teamwork. It's, and it's nerve-wracking. There's a question I love to ask people, and if you don't 
one answer. If you don't have an answer, that's fine too. Um, what, if you can say, has been something that you can laugh about now, but was like a crazy or bad situation <laughs> on stage or we've all got these stories of stuff that's happened. Oh, no. <laughs> you can change the names of people too. I actually, I don't have to change the name. I remember being a kid, complete ignorant, and all I know, my because I entered a special music training program, and the only thing we are allowed to do is play music. We're not allowed to do any sports because it might hurt our hands. And so I was a very spoiled child, and I don't know how to sew at all. And I remember going to concerts one day and trip over my concert dress and rip the bottom, uh, you know, this, the what do you call the seams down there? Yeah. And I don't know what to do. So I remember borrowing, I tried to tape it with the duct tape backstage. It didn't work. And finally, I figured out the best thing to do is using a staple gun. Okay. And closed all the concert clothes. And I tell you, it's kind of heavy and it creates a lot of noise when I walk on yeah. stage. But I, f- I believe for like, I was about 14. That season, I carry a stable, yeah. <laughs> stapler mm-hmm. in my concert bag just to, in case I need to sew anything. And my mother, my poor mother, when I went home from the boarding school and she saw all my clothes with staplers everywhere, <laughs> we didn't have anything wrong. Just, She's horrified. <laughs> She's totally horrified. So they decided I need to learn how to sew. But <laughs> Yeah, and I was at a concert last year. Mm-hmm. And a conductor, something had happened, and they had a stapler. There and were, you go. And they were stapling his shirt <laughs> uh, in the front yes. of it. So and it's David Finkel, my dear husband, once forgot his cufflinks. And our daughter, Lillian, was three, and we used to travel with Cheerio boxes. So it was easy. You take some Cheerio boxes, Cheerios, you put it on your, do it as a cuffling and put a string through it. Okay. And after the concert, you can eat your Cheerio in order to it's get out of it. It's a reward for playing well. <laughs> so there's a lot of um, uh, malfunction, wardrobe malfunction stories in our life. Very yeah. few people understand. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Thankfully, I sit in the back row. I have many times used the twisty ties from bread. There you go. As cufflinks. <laughs> there you That's, go. That's it happens. <laughs> exactly. Well, thank you so much, Wuhan. Um, do you have a, a website you want to tell us? or? You can always go to David Finkel and Wuhan. And those strange spelling, Finkel spell F-I-N-C-K-E-L. You have to spell A-N-D and Wu. Is W U not W O O, so W U H A N, and you can find out all of our concerts. You can find out all of our activities. We just add in a section called the resource sections. In there are some of our thoughts, uh, some of the lectures that we give, how to be how to be a musician, how to be a presenters, and David also has a huge one hundred short videos that he make on the road. They're pretty funny, some yeah. of them. Uh, it's called Cello Talk. And right. they're quite famous. A lot of people watch that. They're, I think the last I saw was half a million people have seen the uh, broadcast. It's 100 cello lessons, and it's quite entertaining. Uh, some of them was filmed in the uh, airplane bathrooms. Okay. <laughs> when I filmed the one in the uh, Atlanta airport. Uh, we're staying in the airport hotel, and the jets were so loud. And David said, hey, let's film one for sound productions. How can you, you how can you beat the jet engine take off? What do you need to do to play as loud as you can? I remember filming that one on the balcony. So it's a okay. lot of fun. <laughs> That's David Finkel and Wuhan.com. Correct. Right. Great. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Classical Breakdown. For more information on Wuhan and the topics we discussed, visit the show notes page at classicalbreakdown.org. You can also send us an email at classicalbreakdown at weta.org. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe in your podcast app. I'm John Banther. Thanks for listening to Classical Breakdown from Classical WETA. Classical Breakdown.